Hello, and welcome to a new edition of Focus One. I'm your host, Frank Alcock. In 2012 and 2013, METV's Focus One show brought viewers approximately 20 programs that illuminated people, politics, and public policies that impacted our area. We've had a hiatus for the past year or so, but we're back and ready to proceed with another series of programs. To start, we're going to preview the Florida Legislature's special session, scheduled for June 1st through the 20th. Will the legislature finally approve a budget and avoid a shutdown? Will Florida's Medicaid program be expanded? Will the governor get his tax cut package? And what about funding for environmental conservation programs? Didn't we pass a constitutional amendment last year? Joining me to discuss these issues is Ms. Susan Nylon, owner and manager of WSRQ Radio and host of the Nylon Report on WSRQ. Welcome to the show, Susan. Thanks, Frank. So how long have you owned the radio station? Uh, well, actually, we're coming up on our fourth anniversary, mm -hmm. July 11th, so we're entering into our fifth year. How do you like owning a radio station? You know, it's it's incredibly different. I think the um, world that, that people acknowledge me on are when I'm on the radio every day. So that's the face that they see, but what they don't realize is literally sometimes minutes before I go on the air, I'm on the phone running a business like every Everybody else right. fighting with you know the phone company or wondering why something's not happening at the tower. Yeah, and so most talk show hosts, whether they be they, political talk, they're not they don't own the station. Correct. As well, right now. And in fact, when I when I when I first bought the station and all the other owners that I spoke with, they're like, oh, you got to get off the air. You can't do both. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain truth to that. So you were doing talk sh talk radio prior to owning the station. Yeah, I've how actually, long have you been doing talk radio? Well, I've done the Nylon Report. Uh, I guess I'll be going on my sixth year, and I was doing it at other radio stations, um, which is why I finally decided to actually own a radio station because I had traveled the show around enough mm -hmm. that I thought, you know, I have a degree in, in communications and I started off in radio. So it was a natural transition for me. I have you been following politics and public policy since getting into radio or is that no, expanded actually, beyond the, in print media or magazines? Or? It was the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, I, I actually got involved in politics because of my, when my son was eight years old, he took an interest in it. And so I was trying to be a good mother and nurture that. And it's through his involvement that I went back to um, one of my first loves, which is journalism and writing. Mm -hmm. And then that blossomed into getting an offer to come and be a point counterpoint talk show host. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, oh my gosh, I forgot what radio was like. I haven't done radio in 20 years. And so it kind of evolved into that. Yes. So. And so you and I know each other. I mean, I've been mm -hmm. a, a guest been a, on the nylon. Guest on, yeah. So there's a little bit of a, I know, a, a I, role reversal here. I I'm, get to be the host and you get to be the guest. I'm going to fight the urge to ask you the questions and, and uh, interview you. Well, so. you know, we, we'll just, it can, be, it can evolve organically. Okay. We'll see where it goes. And then we, we also <laughs> have, beyond uh, the contact from the radio shows, sure. um, you are the program chair and vice president of Sarasota Tiger Bay. I know, right? and, and you currently are the president. I was just going to say, you know, I, I heard you had a great president right over there at Tiger Bay. But <laughs> well, you know, it'd be nice if you showed up every once in a while to the programming meetings. But <laughs> I will. Well, you know, well, you've kind of cut them down, so uh, less I have, is better. You know, that's uh, they, they, some people would say I'm very conservative in this measure. I immediately took the position and said we have too many meetings. We need to cut the cost and be more efficient. So. Susan Nylon, conservative. Same <laughs> sentence. I'd, it's hard. It's, it's hard to swallow, right? Let, let's get to a, <laughs> let's get to the session. So, sure. what do you think the chances are um, that they don't strike a budget deal by July first uh, and the government shuts down? I think they will st strike a budget deal. I, d I don't think that is really up to question. In fact, I haven't heard from anyone who carries any weight that they're not going to. Uh, to put out a budget. It's just not possible for many reasons. First of all, you know, the governor came in and from his very first day, very first session in office, they met the budget and it's been consistent. And if he has any flag to wave, it's that. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's going to get to a point where there's a budget shutdown. And, and most 
most people who wave that wand is only they're only trying to incite people to make the public nervous. But I don't think it's yeah. Really I would a, a agree question. with you. And so one of the things I think that I I, I would I, I try to clarify is we hear shutdown, um, but both I think the impacts fall out. Uh, and probabilities of shutdown, federal government shutdown and the state government shutdown, mm -hmm. I would uh, tend to be quite, quite different. At the, you certainly have fundamental core differences between Democrats and Republicans at the federal level. Um, here, Republicans control both chambers of the legislature Correct. as well as the governor's yeah, mansion. Smacking themselves so in, in a way, face. the circular firing mm -hmm. squad. And another thing I'm not sure if people realize, I mean, federal governments are extremely, uh, the programs are important, but they don't touch people's lives as much as a lot of what state government does. Absolutely. And, and so a, sh a shutdown, would, you'd notice it really, really yeah, fast. Yeah, because we'd be all picketing their offices and their homes and when they shop at the grocery store. Yeah. So it's a it's it's much more impactful. I don't and think I, I get paid too because I'm a, a Florida yeah, you would, state employee. Well, and I will tell you that even with a federal uh, government shutdown, which occurred last year, I was directly affected by it because my radio station is run by the FCC, FEC, and that no FCC, sorry, um, and and that was one of the elements that that shut down, and it set business way back. So people think that it didn't have an impact locally, it actually did. There were a lot of us that were deeply affected by. It. Um, but I, I agree with you. I just think I don't think anybody's taking that seriously. So let's but mo let's move into a, a very short review um, of what led us to the impasse that we're at. Um, it's not necessarily uh, fiscal issues, pure and simple. There, it's healthcare, and, and oh, this is what. Healthcare. So there's a fundamental difference in terms of uh, where the Florida Senate and where uh, the Florida House and Governor, although he's flipped a little bit, um, where they are respectively on the issue of expanding Medicaid. Sure. So absolutely, the the Senate was pretty much decided. They were in lockstep of each other of their proposal to expand Medicaid for whatever you want to call it. Um, they were working on a program that would give an alternate exchange mm -hmm. uh, for all of the people that would no longer be funded by the low income program, the LIP program for healthcare. Right. And they sent it to the House. Um, the shutdown occurred just because the leadership did not have a handle on where the House was going. Um, now, if you, if you hear what the leadership had to say, it's like, we didn't think that we would actually have any progress the last couple of days, so what difference does it make? We might as well shut it down. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that's true. I actually believe there was a lot more people that in the, in the House that were going along with the Senate bill. Mm. And therefore, it was easier to cut it off and regroup than to let it get out of control. So you think that uh, in, there was a tactical move, that there might totally. have been uh, momentum within the House for the Medicaid. Um, so let me, again, uh, I want to paint a picture in terms of, uh, I think, some of how this is framed ideologically by people on uh, either side. And sure. just ask you to uh, comment uh, on it. The, you know, the, we, we have a problem. Uh, it's a nationwide problem, but it's pretty acute in the state of Florida with respect to the number of, of uh, people that do not have uh, health care insurance. Mm -hmm. And so we have 800,000 Floridians. Many of them are what, they fall into what's known as the, the gap uh, in that they, they don't make enough money. They're too poor to qualify for the, the Obamacare, American Health Healthcare uh, uh, Act uh, exchanges, mm -hmm. uh, yet they're not poor enough to qualify for Florida Medicaid Correct. under existing rules. A big push on the part of the federal government has been uh, to expand state Medicaid uh, programs mm -hmm. uh, to cover that, to eliminate that gap. Uh, now, the Supreme Court ruled uh, that the federal government cannot force uh, states to expand their Medicaid programs. Sure. And so states have been breaking uh, in different ways. Um, uh, Florida, uh, uh, under a Republican conservative uh, governor, uh, uh, they've opted uh, to this point not to expand um, the the program now, the Senate as you know it's uh, a Republican uh, a Senate president, but I think the 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 draw or one of the huge incentives is that if you were to, if we were to expand uh, Medicaid. Uh, the government will pick up nine out of every ten dollars that it mm -hmm. cost. About ninety percent of the cost will be picked up by mm -hmm. uh, the federal government. So it's a great 
deal. Certainly the hospitals, uh, much Support of the healthcare it. is very supportive of it, but it still is uh, a significant fiscal commitment. It's not you know pennies. This might amount to about $5 billion, and it, and it counts as the expansion of, of, of government. And so I think... Well, uh, except for the fact that it's a tiered program. So eventually the federal government will wean the states off of that program. And I think that is has always been the main concern mm -hmm. is at least from the Republican members that I talk to it's like all right well it's great now but what's going to happen after we get weaned off of it because eventually we'll have to foot the whole bill now originally it was a 10-year plan I don't know if the uh, Florida House and Senate, if they decided to go with the plan from the federal government, if it would reset at 10 years, or they would say, well, actually, now it's eight because you've wasted two, um, which is, I'm inclined to think it's more like that. So the idea is, is can you can the state support it after the federal government goes away? Um, that's been their, their main concern. My complaint has always been, but you're really not working, you have, a, you have that length of time to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, people are dying on a, reg, on a daily basis. So why aren't you working towards figuring out that problem if that really is your main concern? I also don't believe that's their main concern. It's just the logical one that they get. What do you think the, is their the opponent's think, main concern? Uh, I think initially they wrote in on a wave of being anti-government, anti-big government, anti-Obama, right. anti and I think it got away from them. They never anticipated the public to be so supportive of this program. They also never anticipated to, for the public to benefit so much from this program. So now they're kind of caught up in their own rhetoric and they don't want to have to backtrack all those years of fighting. I mean, how many times in the federal government did they fight the Health Care Reform Act? I think the last time I stopped counting was 52. And why doesn't anybody actually call them on the fact that they wasted so much time? And now, you know, how many times have they gone to the Supreme Court? It's like, why aren't you working in case, in case it does work? Why aren't you preparing for the future? And the LIP program is a perfect example. The li yeah, so let's just clarify for the viewers mm -hmm. um, the, the LIP program and how it works. It's, it's administered by uh, the, the state. The, the sta um, well, it's administered. It was an idea that came out of Florida, yes. approved by the federal government, the same offices, agencies that run Medicaid and mm -hmm. Medicare uh, administer it. But what, how it works is rather than covering people through some sort of insurance, uh, there are a number of hospitals uh, mm -hmm. that provide provide uh, health care, frontline health care, to the indigent low-income population, they never get compensated for it from those individuals, mm -hmm. and then they're refunded after the fact um, through this LIP program. And so it's, it, it's it, we have that large pool of uh, close to a million people that don't have insurance under the current mechanism, the LIP program, um, we have a number of uh, health care providers that are willing to essentially to, to you know, to take care of those people um, at no charge, and then they'll get money back through the LIP program afterwards. But the federal government wants, they don't want to do it that way. They think it's more efficient to actually cover those people through Medicaid. Okay, so it's a little bit more intricate than that. Uh, the LIP program is a lump sum that's given to the state, and right. the state gets to delegate who benefits from that program. Mm -hmm. um, and then you could take it a step further. We, you know, we always talk about the gap between those that can afford. Uh, to uh, come forward the health care um, through the health care exchange versus those on Medicaid. Um, there is a gap. It's not just based on income mm -hmm. as well. It's also based on opportunity. A lot of men aren't covered under those programs because they don't have kids. They don't have families that they're supporting. Mm -hmm. So there's a sect of the population that the federal government says, you know, they always get skipped mm -hmm. because they don't, they don't have the qualifiers that everyone does. Well, so we're not going to fund the LIP program anymore. Mm -hmm. We told you that a year and a half ago. So the fact that it's a surprise to you now shouldn't be. We've asked you to expand Medicaid, but specifically expand Medicaid for those people that are spe specifically not in mm -hmm. those programs. So the hospitals get a, a, a check to cover indigent care, but yet there's still people out there who don't get the care that they need because they don't follow, they don't fall into those categories. Okay, so the federal government um, would like to stop. Uh, it's indicated that it wants Florida sure. to come up with an alternative. Um, yeah, they want them to do it. And the governor change. essentially sued or filed a lawsuit mm -hmm. saying that this is uh, coercion on the part of the federal government. And there's a certain truth to that. Mm -hmm. uh, what the, 
the decision out of Washington the most recently is, well, we're going to continue to provide a reduced rate of LIP mm -hmm. funding. We'll cut it from about a uh, little over $2 billion down to $1 billion and then $600 million. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, do we come to, d does the issue of health care and taking care of that population or expanding um, Medicaid, do you think that's going to be resolved this month at the legislative session? You know, there's there's talk right now pulling it out of the budget um, and not dealing with it at all and mm -hmm. kicking it, you know, down the road to the next session, the which is they're the very good at. They've been doing that all along. However, in order to balance the budget, they have to make up for that money. So uh, the governor has proposed a bunch of tax cuts that in the in the big scheme of things, we won't notice them all. Um, but I don't think they'll cover enough. So they'll take away tax credits, you know, how we have that free weekend of back to school tax credits. Um, we have other programs that are very small that from our wallet we won't really notice. But I just don't think it's a, a big enough gesture. Yeah, I think the, well, the biggest piece of that tax cut proposal was uh, cell phone and cable bill. Yeah, uh, that's we about get, uh, half of that overall. I think that's probably like four hundred million out correct, of the, the, which the is close amazing. to seven hundred million. So I think for me, I, I might get an extra four or five dollars a month back and uh, correct and uh, my my cable and yes, exactly. But. But but my brother I, might not have health <laughs> insurance coverage. <laughs> but I, I, I just don't think that it's really going to make a difference. I don't think it's going to help, and it still doesn't acknowledge the fact that we have people that don't get the health care that they need, that they're not getting it. And the public still pays for it. You know, the, the hospitals pay for it. We still pay for it. We still pay for it because when we personally go into the hospital, we have incredible right. large hospital the, bills that have to make up for it. So I think that we need to really push this That's issue. where you, the cost is. So do you, so do you think uh, the end game for this month um, okay. is uh, some of the governor's tax cuts get compromised yeah. in order um, for the state to sort of sweeten its contribution sure. to the lip pool and just keep that thing in I place? I think they're going to do exactly that. I think they're going to mandate it. But that doesn't solve the, the Medicaid expansion. No, of course issue. not. But so we're still going to have close to eight. Could be somebody people. else's problem if we kick it down the road far enough. Well, we're probably. So you think we're at least we're kicking it to next year? And I then think maybe we're going to definitely. I don't think they're going to come to a consensus. I, I, not in the House. I really don't. And I, and the governor's already said he's not going to sign it. So it's, it's kind of a fait accompli. You're the gonna, Medicaid expansion. Correct. Yeah. No. I so think. you 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 do all this work. You you feel as a as a legislative member, you're spending all this time on something that you know the governor is not going to sign. Well, you might as well kick it down the road and work on something. How many other bills didn't get signed because they pulled themselves from the House three or four days before? So, I mean, it, frankly, it's embarrassing. Um, uh, well, if I get, what about Governor Scott's health care, the Commission on Health Care uh, Funding and Spending? Um, how does that come into play? It seems, I don't think they're going to produce anything during the legislative I, session. I have to ask. And that's actually chaired by one of the uh, developer, uh, Carlos Baruf, from who, our who, area. You no, know, he's very well studied on health care. Did you know that? Uh, no. I mean, his credentials in health care go, you know, I don't know, what, five seconds? I mean, other than uh, the, the talking points that he got before he went into the meeting, I don't understand how you can have a health care panel where only one member of that panel has anything to do with health care. And the person who's involved in the health care panel is actually against the exchanges. Well, maybe, maybe um, it's just a fresh look. Maybe, maybe the, those that these? are in the health care industry are just a little bit too close and too, they have too much personal interest. So if we bring in uh, people that have expertise in financing uh -huh. and business, they I can again that. provide a fresh perspective without sort of being hostage to the special interest if, within the industry. And if there was a few people on the panel like that and the rest were health care experts, then I would say it was a good marriage, but there isn't. And, what do you and think they're going, though? What do you think is going to come out? What are the, you know, the potential messages coming out I of think, that? I think it's a bunch of political favors. I think the governor is looking for his future. He's what lining What are they going to say? We should uh, privatize all of the hospital industry or um, well, you that, don't need the money uh, in, in Medicaid or, you know, there's a commission. They, they hopefully they'll, they're going to say something at the, end of their, at the end of the day with respect to the financing and funding of... You know, I think income. they're going to be in lockstep with what the governor wants. I mean, he's been on the table from the very beginning about wanting to privatize hospitalization. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just it. He, there's a, it's, been, it's been consistent. Why would he put a panel together that disagrees with them? Okay, well, I'm going to come back to the governor in a, okay, in a okay. minute. But let me <laughs> swing back. Um, 
one of the the issues that we didn't touch upon. So we we covered actually, I think the the, the potential fate of what the governor wanted in terms of a uh, tax cut package. But let's come back to, you know, we both of us have interest in the environment, sure. um, and we followed. We have talked about on previous programs constitutional amendments, not only on the environment but a mm -hmm. variety of other issue areas. So um, we had one pass, uh, amendment, amendment one, one. Yeah. Um, and if you recall, I was a little bit of a. Uh, a devil's advocate, not on the You were the a naysayer to the, to the bill, if I remember correctly. What did I say was gonna happen? You said the language was too ambiguous, and what they would use it for is a um, opportunity to defund uh, Florida forever mm -hmm. and use it specifically for their pet projects. How was happening? You called it. That's exactly what's happening, and, and uh, sad, but it's true. So uh, there's, I've gotten a lot of uh, emails. There's been some momentum on the pro-environment lobbying side. And um, it's not simply pro-environment and conservation, actually, with respect to um, land acquisition for the purposes of conservation. You've got some heavy hitters there that mm -hmm. would like to free up and use a lot of that money for, I think, the intended purpose of the, the amendment, which is, again, to uh, acquire uh, lands and then put them into uh, you know, easements and conservation. Um, do you think that pushback uh, during this potential pushback during the session, because it is a budget issue, yeah. is going to result in any reallocation of monies towards what you know the the conservation proponents would like to see, or is they simply going to be kind of crickets picking out the, I, I, the, the I lawn that nobody seems to care I, about? I think it's just a part of the budget, something that they're required to do. I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of thought put into it. Mm -hmm. um, the state legislator warned us that once it passed, they're like, now we got to figure out how to handle it. So I don't think they're going to champion uh, the same projects that we thought, the public thought when voting for it, um, that they were going to do. I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're we're in a cross between whether we save the Everglades or not and whether we buy up land or not. Why aren't we just using that? Why did they defund, why did, excuse me, why did they defund Florida forever? I mean, it was never the intention of the voting public to handle it the way they are, but to them it's just another budget item. Great, now I don't have to take the money out of this uh, to you know, fix the pump that takes care of that lake. I'm gonna pull it out of this you know, Amendment 1 program. So. I mean, I don't. In fairness to the legislature, okay. though, that's what the the text of the amendment said. Correct. It didn't say, "Thou shalt use this new revenue stream." Or this actually, it's not a new revenue stream. It's a dedicated portion mm -hmm. of uh, dock uh, stamp taxes. Correct. Um, uh, dedicated and use that for environmental management. It didn't say use it for funding Florida Forever. It said Florida Forever or. Um, restoration of environmental lands uh, and or it, 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 the language was loose enough that it, even environmental mm -hmm. management so my read uh, back you know was like you can according to this amendment use sure. it to pay salaries within agencies and I think what a lot of other folks you know, the water infrastructure which is not conservation per se mm -hmm. um, but water supply infrastructure projects those are really expensive um, and I think you know the authors of the amendment left some room for them to use some of those funds for water infrastructure and that that's you know that could soak it up really you know quickly pardon the pun i think part of the problem is how we write the amendments a lot of the amendments people feel in order to pass have to be kind of ambiguous have to be kind of widespread to get the consensus from the general pop, uh, public when we have a requirement of a supermajority. Mm -hmm. If we get too specific, we might find that we alienate groups of people. And so a lot of logic goes into any amendment is better than no amendment because we've gone through years when Rick Scott first took office, he defunded Florida forever anyway, mm -hmm. and we had no recourse. At least with Amendment 1, it's guaranteed that this money is going to be spent and has to be spent every year. So it's our job to legislate the legislator or to petition them to actually do the right thing with what it was intended. Um, you could look at medical marijuana and Charlotte's Web. We think we passed it, and yet it's still not available in the state because mm -hmm. it's been up with the state legislature for now two sessions, and they don't know how to handle it. So the, we've got it on the books, but they, there's no progress. Let me shift back. We don't have a huge amount of time, but uh, to Governor Scott, I mean, I th 
I don't think um, uh, the Medicaid expansion issue is going away. I think we're in agreement that okay. I think a budget is going to get mm -hmm. done and it's not going to include Medicaid expansion. Um, and they're probably going to, you know, borrow from Peter and Paul mm -hmm. to put a little bit more in the lip fund mm -hmm. and, you know, the hospitals won't like it, but the pinch won't be as severe, at least for another year or two. But this issue will continue. Um, for Governor Scott, there's been talk in the local press and the papers about uh, potentially having interest in running for a Senate seat when he vacates the governor's mansion sure. in 2018. How do you think this Medicaid or health care issue is going to play for him? I mean, I got to tell you, from 40,000 feet, I mean, the, the, the administrator career didn't exactly, it wasn't quite stellar with the, you know, the, the fraud case, but do you think he'll be better positioned um, running for the Senate if the Medicaid issue remains unresolved, if we continue to have a large uninsured yeah, population? I think it, it do you think that's going to be a liability, or do you think the benefits of him holding the line and being one of the governors that refuses to get on board uh, with elements of the Obamacare program, that will benefit him in a primary and position him better for... Um, you know, when somebody makes a decision to run for a higher office, it's not just about them. It's all the people that they've collected along the way and how they'll benefit as well. So the commitments, the promises that an individual makes when running for office are go well beyond, I've checked with my wife and she's supportive. So he has always run on that position of privatization, of uh, less government, and as long as there's a voting block of people that will support it. Now, so there's there's con his consistency he's is con going. He's very consistent. Now, that doesn't mean that it, the Medicaid expansion won't come back to bite him because he now has a record to run on, and it has to be statewide. And as time goes on and more and more stories come out of the successes of the program in other states mm -hmm. and the fact that we can't get anything done here, that could come back to bite him. But it also depends on who he's running against. Yeah, well, he's, he's having a confab this week uh, in Orlando. Uh, string of uh, Republican governor candidates for the presidency. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, this is the event of focusing on the economy. I guess state economies. Uh, it's not hosted by the Republican Party. It's actually hosted by his uh, political action committee. Yeah. Let's get to work, I think. Um, is, again, this is just more posturing for He's totally currying favor, Absolutely. getting into the national conversation. Uh, well, if you think about it, any time that Rick Scott gets into the national spotlight, it's all negative. It's all things that aren't functional in Florida. Um, so he now has to start aligning himself. And if, his, if, if you have those 8, 12, 25 members of the Republican Party that are running for president and Rick Scott's picture, it's going to start putting Coast, Rick, a yeah. different spin on who he is. So sure. Plus, it's a, you know, it's a different election cycle. So if he picks up a few of those supporters and get some, if any of them make president and they want to tap him on the shoulder, I definitely I think, think the, it's the guess is Huckabee, him. Governor, former Governors Huckabee, uh, Rick Perry, that's Scott's, you know, BF, I mean, they're, they're, they're tight I buds. Know. Uh, um, Scott Walker, Chris Christie, Bobby Jindal, um, former Governor Bush, obviously, mm -hmm. it wasn't a long drive, you know, it, it, he certainly has a, sure. roots in Florida. Um, uh, Rubio uh, got tied up, but he was the only non-governor that think. I think he's appearing by a video, but I didn't see Donald Trump's name. I know. On I was a little list. shocked about that. I don't think he's. Well, he he is statesman of the year twice in a. In he's a row. been here, so but yeah. he's, he's not. I, I. However, he did when he was here um, really slam, you know, uh, Jeb Bush. And, uh, he slammed just about everybody. all of those guys. He slammed everybody except so for maybe, himself. So maybe I think. he cut himself out of the club. That might have been it. Mm -hmm. um, Susan, there's the half hour went by so quickly, but I think there are many, many other things uh, sure. that we'd have fun talking oh, yeah. about. So uh, as, as we come back from our hiatus on Focus One uh, and schedule some more programs, I hope you wouldn't mind being a regular guest on the show. Absolutely. Anytime. Maybe we could even flip flop. You I'll, know, I'll interview you, you next time. You can interview me. With <laughs> any final thoughts on the legislative session before we? I don't think there's going to be any surprises. I just think that they are going to do what they're absolutely required to do. And they will tell everybody that um, just wait until next session and, and we'll fix it. Yeah, that's interesting, too, for me to ask either to comment or write a, a blog on this. There was so much drama and surprise uh, when mm -hmm. Chris Afoli, the speaker, you know, pulled up tent and walked out, sure. leaving many, many bills um, mm -hmm. to die. Um, 
really mm -hmm. important ones too. And you know, the, the t attention was turned to the special session and now as the special session is starting, it's as if like nobody, we all know how it's gonna end and it's, there's no more drama. Because the they're all getting ready to run for election That's right. and re-election. And there's such a big shift also taken into consideration if Senator Dietert ends up vacating her Senate seat. That's right. How much of a political shift there's gonna be even in our own community. So who knows what's gonna All right, we'll bring you back out. to talk about that Definitely. pretty soon. Uh, well, it looks like we're out of time for today. I'd like to thank METV for continuing to produce Focus One. I'd like to thank Susan Nylon for being our guest today. And I'd like to thank our viewers for tuning in. We'll see you again soon.